So once again, whatever this is, it is not science by definition, it's religion. But despite the fact the Constitution prohibits the U.S. government from having a state religion, that now is our state religion. And it's also the religion of the media and the public health industry, which has grown dramatically over the past three years. So what happens next? Well, as it happens, we have some reference points that give us clues. Whenever you have a religious movement with no God at the center, you have disaster. That's what Marxism was. Zealots want to punish people in the name of of their faith. That's always been true. It happens around the world still. Shiite Muslims regularly flagellate themselves all over the world, Iraq, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, to commemorate the death death of Muhammad's grandson. You're seeing those images on your screen right now. At least that's a real religion, time-tested over a thousand years. Catholics in the Philippines sometimes flagellate themselves on Easter weekend as a form of atonement. They take their shirts and shoes off and whip themselves. You're seeing that right now. So clearly, this is a human impulse. Around the world, people self-flagellate in the name of religious faith. In India, Hindu yogis pierce their cheeks and run spikes through their faces. This is pretty graphic, but it happens. These are people of faith. We're not criticizing them. We're just saying this is a feature of religion. But at least there's a God at the center of it. In the United States, there is no God at the center of it. So what does that mean? It means you're about to be severely punished in the name of someone else's crackpot climate religion. For example, the next time you go to the hospital for surgery, the doctor could very well tell you, can't really give you anesthesia. We'll tell you it's necessary to pull back on the painkillers in the name of climate. We're not making this up, by the way. Mm -hmm. Doctors at the Henry Ford Health System in Michigan are now proposing to cut their carbon footprint by a tenth of a percent by reducing the amount of anesthesia they give to patients. For real, you wheel in there for an appendectomy or any kind of medical procedure, and you're really going to suffer because the climate god demands it. How far are we from, like, the Mayan or Aztec system? (laughs) Not as far as we think. As one physician in that system put it, quote, for a long time, there was a notion that the greenhouse effect caused in healthcare settings was an inevitable and unavoidable cost of providing patient care. But we have learned that reducing anesthetic gas flow is one of the many ways healthcare can lessen its contribution to the global warming crisis. (laughs) Think about that for a second. If you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, if you really believe carbon was the main poison in our environment, which of course is not, but if you thought it was, getting rid of anesthesia or reducing the amount of painkillers you give to people while cutting them with scalpels would probably be the last thing you would do. A decade ago, researchers in Germany suggested that reducing the amount of anesthesia giving to patients would lower greenhouse gas emissions and protect the ozone layer. So that was 10 years ago. And at the time, the idea didn't catch on right away because it's insane and it dramatically increases human suffering, which we try to reduce because this is civilization after all. But as civilization recedes 10 years later, hospitals in the U.S. are suddenly deciding, wow, that's a great idea. Make people suffer more, atone for their climate sins? We're on board. So the question is, again, referring back to the primitive religions that dominated this earth until pretty recently, the Mayas, the Aztecs, and every other human sacrifice-oriented religion, how long until these hospitals decide that the best way to reduce their carbon footprint is to make their patients go to sleep permanently? That's happening in Canada. The government of Canada has killed thousands and thousands of its own citizens, thousands of them. Was carbon footprint of those people part of it? I don't know. But in the end, false religions wind up killing people. If you're thinking to yourself, well, I just won't go to the hospital in Germany or Detroit, that's not going to work because it's not the specific solution that they're proposing. It's the way they think. And this kind of thinking is everywhere now. It's not just in hospitals trying to reduce greenhouse emissions. Joe Biden's EPA just announced a plan to, quote, eliminate nearly all greenhouse gas emissions from transportation by 2050. Really, how are you going to do that since these people know nothing about energy or engineering? They don't know anything about anything. So their solutions are not likely to improve life here. So their new idea is to reduce so-called commuting miles through, and we're quoting now, an increase in remote work and virtual engagements. In other words, they want you to stay inside your house and not have physical contact with other people. And while you're stuck inside your house, in the name of protecting the environment, don't even think about using your gas stove. 
or your fireplace or your wood stove or heating the place. So what they're doing since the COVID lockdowns are over is continuing to encourage employers to keep their employees at home, to isolate people in their little pods, make them powerless. And they're not doing this because it's good for the economy. Obviously, it's not good for the economy. They're doing it because their religion demands it. it makes you look at that FAA meltdown a few weeks ago in a brand new light. What was that really about, right? So you're not allowed to get anesthesia in the hospital, and pretty soon you might not be able to go outside to work anymore. What else are you allowed to have in the name of the climate crisis? Well, how about no more heat or air conditioning or electricity or cars or wearing leather or eating meat or having children? All are sins against the climate. So for you, it is insects, tap water, and celibacy. That's a tough religion. Even John the Baptist got to eat honey and locusts. No more honey for you. We're beyond self-denial. We're in the next phase. Praise be our Lord Jesus Christ. In a recent interesting interview on Fox News, titled The Church of Environmentalism, journalist Tucker Carlson has brought to light a contradiction that may have escaped the notice of many people, but which I consider extremely revealing. Carlson recalls that the American Constitution prohibits any state religion, but for some time, the governing Democratic Party has imposed on the American people the globalist court with its green agenda, its woke dogmas, its condemnation and cancel culture, its priests of the World Health Organization, the prophets of the World Economic Forum. A religion in all respects, all encompassing not only for the life of the individuals who practice it, but also in the life of the nation that publicly confesses it, adapts law and sentences to it, and inspires education and every governmental action around it. In the name of the globalist religion, its adherents demand that all citizens behave in accordance with the morality of the new world order, accepting uncritically and with an attitude of devout submission to religious authority, the doctrine defined ex cathedra by the Davos Synodrine. Citizens are not required merely to share the motivation that justify the health, economic, or social policies imposed by government, but to give their blind and irrational assent, which goes far behind faith. For this reason, it is not allowed to contest the psychopandemic, criticize the management of the vaccination campaign, argue the groundlessness of climate alarms, oppose the evidence of NATO's provocation of the Russian Federation with the Ukrainian crisis, ask for investigation into Hunter Biden's laptop, or the electoral fraud that prevented President Trump from remaining in the White House or refuse to stand by as children are corrupt with the LGBTQ obscenities. After three years of follies, incomprehensible to a rational mind, but amply justifiable in a perspective of blind fideism, the proposal formulated by the American clinic to ask patients to give up part of their anesthesia so as to reduce their trace of carbon dioxide and save the planet should therefore 
not be read as a grotesque pretext to reduce hospital expenses to the detriment of patients, but as a religious act, a penance to be accepted willingly, an ethical meritorious act. The penitential character is indispensable in this operation of forced conversion to the masses, of the masses, because it counterbalances the absurdity of the action with the reward of the promised good, where the mask, which is useless, the citizen, religious adherent, has made his own gesture of submission, has suffered himself to the divinity, the state, and the community. A submission confirmed with the equally public act of vaccination, which represented a sort of baptism in the globalist faith, the initiation into worship. The high priests of this religion have even reached the point of theorizing human sacrifice by means of abortion and euthanasia. A sacrifice required by the common good so as not to overpopulate the planet, burden public health, or be a burden on social security. Even the mutilation of which, to which those who profess gender doctrine are subjected, and the depriva deprivation of the reproductive faculties induced by homosexuality are nothing more than forms of sacrifice and immolation of oneself and one's body, one's health, including life itself, receiving, for example, an experimental gene therapy demonstrably dangerous and often deadly. Adherence to globalism is not an optional. It is the state religion and the state tolerates no practitioners to the extent that their presence does not prevent society from exercising this cult. Indeed, it is presumption of being legal legitimized by ethical principles to impose on citizens what represent an incontestable superior good. The state also obliged the centers to perform the basic act of globalist morality, punishing them if they do not conform to its precept. Eating insect and not meat, injecting drugs instead of practicing healthy life, using electricity instead of gasoline, renouncing private property and freedom of movement, enduring controls and limitation of fundamental rights, accepting the worst moral and sexual deviation in the name of freedom, renouncing the family to, be, to live isolated, without inheriting anything from the past and without transmitting anything to posterity, erasing one's identity in the name of political correctness, denying the Christian faith to embrace woke superstition, conditioning one's work and one's subsistence to the respect to respect absurd rules. All these are elements destined to become part of the daily life of individual, 
a, be, a life based on an ideological model that on closer inspection no one wants, no one has asked for, and that justifies its existence only with the bogeyman of an unproven and unprovable, improbable ecological apocalypse. This violates not only the much vaunted freedom of religion on which this society is founded, but want to lead us step by step, inexorably, to the point of making this cult exclusive and the only one allowed. The Church of the Environmentalism defines itself as inclusive but does not tolerate dissent, does not accept directly engaging with those who question his dictates. Those who do not accept the anti-gospel of Davos are ipso facto heretics and must therefore be punished, excommunicated, separated from the social body and considered public enemies. They must be re-educated by force, both through an incessant harmony of the media and also through the imposition of a social stigma and truly extortive forms of consent. Starting with the informed consent of submitting against their will to the vaccination obligation and continuing in the madness of the so-called city of 15 minutes, which is anticipated moreover in detail in the programmatic points of the 2030 agenda, which are ultimately dogmatic canons to the contrary. The problem with this disturbing phenomenon of mass superstition is that this state religion has not been imposed de facto only in the United States of America, but it has also spread to all the nations of the world, of the Western world especially, whose leaders were converted to the globalist world by the great apostle of the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab, its itself proclaimed Pope, who is therefore invested with an infallible and incontestable authority. And so, as in the Annuario Pontificio, we can read the list of cardinals, bishops, and prelates of the Roman Curia, and the dioceses spread throughout the world. So on the website of the World Economic Forum, we find the list of prelates of globalism, from Justin Trudeau to Emmanuel Macron, discovering that not only the president and prime ministers of many states belongs to this church, but also numerous officials, head of the international body, and major multinational corporations, and members of the media. To this must also be added the preachers and the missionaries who work for the spread of the globalist faith, actors, singers, influencers, sportsmen, intellectuals, doctors, teachers, a very powerful, highly organized network widespread not only at the top of institution, but also in university and courts, in companies and hospitals, in the peripheral bodies and local municipalities, in cultural and sport associations, 
so that it is impossible to escape indoctrination. Even in a provincial primary school or in a small rural community. It is disconcerting 